Blog Talk Radio. Do you know who I am? No. Well, if you knew who I was, then you would know what I'm going to do with you if you don't tell me what I need to know. Maybe, but I don't know who you are. Do you know what kind of damage a steel boot can do to prepubescent testicles? How would I know that? Tell me where the target is before I kick you in the nuts! Get the hand off of me! I'm a proud American! Damn it! I knew this great country was gonna go... Hey, Back. What's that being popped up became commander in chief? Do you want me to kick you in the nuts? No. Do you want me to kick you in the nuts? No. Do you want me to... Wait, Jack. I do not want you to kick him in the nuts. Context of white supremacy. Dusty Renegade. Justice. And for another program to share constructive information on racism, white supremacy, what it is, and how it works. Thank you all for tuning in to the broadcast. Um, as this is August 26th, obviously we are still broadcasting because I did get the funds to uh, pick up the MacBook Pro. Should be placing the order within uh, minutes. So uh, hopefully we'll have that brand new MacBook Pro uh, before Labor Day weekend where we get into uh, the thick of programs next week. Uh, at any rate, um, today's program, uh, I'm very pleased. Uh, anytime I can have uh, our guest today on the broadcast, uh, he is easily uh, one of my favorite guests uh, that uh, I've had on the program. And I can't even say my favorite guest. I think he is uh, one of uh, our listeners' favorite guests as well. Uh, and I think that's because of the uh, just extraordinary insight and uh, intelligence that he has about racism, white supremacy, extremely helpful information. And in fact, I wanted to uh, begin the broadcast reading <clears throat> a comment that a listener made uh, before the program today. The uh, program hadn't even started, and he, he was already thanking uh, our guest for coming back and speaking with us again. He said, um, I have bought excuses, excuses, the politics of interracial coupling and European culture, menticide, and asafo. So far, I have finished excuses, excuses, and have almost completed menticide. Dr. Baruti's writing exhibits laser-focused examples of black defeatism and ways to overcome the Negro state of mind. I look forward as should all to his appearance. He goes on to say, Dr. Baruti, after listening to you on the cows, I decided to purchase your extraordinary books. In my opinion, your work is a perennial example of African resistance against white supremacy. Your approach to subjects such as interracial dating and homosexuality is intelligent, non-caustic, and virtuous. Very refreshing. I will continue to support you and myself by purchasing your books and collecting the strategies and wisdom that they contain. Uh, from Asar, uh, again, he left these comments before uh, today's program uh, even got started uh, in appreciation for uh, our guest. Uh, I want to make sure I have, uh, have my lines correct here. Uh, our guest for uh, today's program, please support his website, Akobenhouse.com. Again, Akobenhouse, A K O B E N, house.com. Uh, our guest is fourth visit to the context of white supremacy, Dr. Mawalimu K. Baruti. I want to see if I have him on the line or if uh, all my lines might have filled up. Dr. Baruti, is this you? Yes, I am here, Brother Gus. It's good oh. to be back. Um, oh, I think this Brother uh, Osar is comments and. Um, People don't. It's it's hard to explain um, the impact that people have on um, my motivation and my wife's motivation, and, and not that if there weren't comments or compliments, compliments or appreciations that we wouldn't do this work. I don't think anything would stop that. But when people take the take the time, because it is taking from their time to um, say things. Um, about the work that you do, which is what you're trying to do, and it tells you that it's 
being successful at doing that and that the person understands that this is more than just um, a writing, um, it, it makes you feel good. I, um, I definitely appreciate what he says. I'm sure that will get, get me through a day or two uh, <laughs> here all by itself. <laughs> so I, I definitely appreciate that. And in uh, fact, this is advice for uh, warrior scholars because this is, I don't think there's a harder job in the world. Um, my uh, queen, Inaya, she made me start um, a file where I put emails from people who say nice things um, about me or us or my work or our work. Um, and whenever things become a little overwhelming, um, I can go into that file that and, and just read a few of them, and it will get you back on track. So that is something that I think that all warriors um, should do. They should keep a um, gratitude journal or keep a file where they keep emails from people who appreciate what they're doing or, or that they love and appreciate. It, it, it works wonders on those uh, difficult days. Wow. Uh, outstanding suggestion to start the broadcast off, and uh, I think that fits nicely uh, from where we left off at on your last visit. We discussed complementarity, and it seems like that uh, gratitude journal, that seems like a, a product of complementarity. Um, does, that, does that sound logical? Y yes, it, yes, it does. Interestingly, it I want to say that it didn't, but the kind of person who is my compliment, that's the lines along which she thinks. And when you're, of course, when you're talking about complementarity, um, and hopefully you're talking about two warriors or two warrior scholars, however you want to phrase it, um, working together, um, one of them, at least one of them, needs to have the good sense to uh, make sure that those two keep their sanity, that they keep their joy. Um, in this world, that's something that's easy to lose. Is the the um, part of or the lyric in, in Earth, Wind, and Fire, that's the way of the world where the child is born and, you know, the heart turns to stone um, because this world can do that to you, especially when you are fighting for people who sometimes seem to not want to be saved in any way, shape, form, or fashion. Um, that has to be part um, of that. And within the, well, yes, that's, that is true. Within the context of complementarity, you end up with a lot of lists of things. You end up with a lot of um, things to work with. Um, I don't remember if when I was on last, I said that people who are um, in the process of finding a compliment or trying to figure out what's going on between them and their compliment in terms of, of issues, they need to make a list of, of things that they're not good at. Um, it involves making a lot of a lot of lists because that allows you to think about things in a more I guess, a concrete way sitting right in front of you. Um, and, of course, they have to be uh, honest, but there needs to be someone, at least one of the two people in that relationship who... Um, is uh, really connected to that that caring side that is about the health of the couple more than anything else, um, and from that come comes all kinds of ideas as to how to keep people healthy and to heal uh, warriors who, of course, weren't always warriors. Um, that's something that most of us tend to, to find or stumble stumble upon, you know, after we've already been socialized into insanity. Again, please support the uh, website. Uh, all of the books that were mentioned uh, that we've discussed so far that Dr. Baruti has authored, they are available at AquabenHouse.com. Uh, Aquaben, A K O B E N, House.com. And it's a link if you're listening at Blog Talk Radio. You can just click uh, Dr. Baruti's name and it will take you right, uh, right to the website. Um, I want to get started, hop in to see if we can cover as much material uh, as possible. Um, the book we want to look at today, uh, The Sex Imperative, um, words, definitions, very important. Uh, well, I looked up imperative, and the definition that I found was an essential or urgent thing as a noun, 
uh, a factor or influence making something necessary, a thing felt as an obligation. Uh, why did you title this book The Sex Imperative? Well, the, the first thought in titling it was to make people or give people reason to understand that this is um, not a choice on the part of the people who own and control this culture and Western society. Um, it is, it, it's not to um, make them innocent. It's to make it understood that this is a natural and normal part of their being, the push toward uh, sexual extreme, sexual perversion, um, everything unnatural and abnormal um, on this planet, if you will. The it's not something that, and, and when you it, it imperative to me carries the magnitude of when. Um, an African says, I just fell in love with this European. And then it makes it so that you can't argue against that because it becomes this biological or, or spiritual whatever thing that they have no control over. Love is something that you're not supposed to have any control over. Choice is supposed to be something that you have no control over, which neither in neither case is it, is it absolutely true. Um, but this imperative, it's, it's, it's a part of, a, an agenda that goes all the way back, if you will, using Rambani's word, a sealy, that it is a uh, spiritual or despiritualized um, function for this group of individuals. These, these beings, they don't have a choice because this is them. There's nothing about this excess or extreme or... Um, push or trying to turn other people into what they are that they see as wrong. They don't. They don't see anything out of the ordinary about it. They see everyone else as wrong who does not um, fit within the um, framework, sexual framework that they have established as being backward or out of pace with reality or somehow abnormal. So this is a normal part of their being. Is to say, if you took um, forty of them newly born and put them on an island because of the nature of the gen genocultural encoding of this at the a level of a sealy at the level of spirit, then the society that would evolve out of that would still end up following these same parameters, this same agenda, this same imperative would be a part of that because that is a natural part of their makeup. So when I say the imperative, um, it's sort of like uh, stated in the in the way that Michael Bradley uh, used the term the Iceman inheritance. Uh, he wasn't talking about um, their um, inordinate uh, drive and propensity for violence and domination based upon some choices that they made as they individually grew up and and life was hard because if it was, then what you would find in them now would be different than what you found with them in the caves because this is supposedly a different environment than that. But that inheritance is something that is a normal, natural part of them that they don't see wrong, even when they are pretending otherwise, which allows them to cover all bases, and no matter who wins in the battle, they still end up victorious and they still are allowed to survive and to breed and to infect again. But the imperative um, is that there is no choice. You use the word necessary and obligating. This is it's, you, it's a compelling um, mentality. And I put it in those terms because this book was written for us. It wasn't written for them. It was written for those of us who really want to understand the sexual insanity that is out here and where it came from and why. Um, and they the, they have to understand that um, it is because we are becoming them that what they do and what they say um, is becoming normal behavior for us, whether we're talking about in the sexual realm or what have you. The, 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 the um, sex is just, you know, one area. And uh, you could take this same discussion and apply it to virtually any other area when we are we are dealing with them. 
uh, there's a, and I don't want to read um, this thing, but um, if when folks really want to understand, and sometimes I need a refresher, when, when folks really un- want to understand the depth to which their mind has become our mind or their interpretation of us in their mind has become our interpretation of us in our mind, uh, Amos Wilson's book, uh, African-Centered Consciousness uh, versus the New World Order, the first um, essay in there, which is he's talking about the qualities and characteristics of, of Marcus Garvey. In there, he really does a, you know, he does it in his other books also, but he does a really good um, sh- shorter version of the um, uh, ingestion, the, the mental absorption of the Europeans' idea of us into us and us acting on it as if it is our own. If we don't understand that this sexual insanity is a normal and natural part of their drive, their uh, will to power, their um, need to dominate, their... um, way of relating to each other because there is no emotional content context out of which they operate, then you will sit and try to self-analyze what's wrong with you. Why are you behaving in this way? Why are you acting in this way? Even though you're trying to break free of it, you'll understand that this is connected to all parts of the socialization process, that this is connected to uh, the identity of Africans in European culture who do not, who are not connected to their ancestral mind. So it is, um, it's, it's, it's not, and it's not something that's negotiable. Um, I've run into a whole bunch of folks who want to um, sit and explain to them, and I try to make them understand this. This they do not see themselves as wrong. They don't see. Uh, the homosexualization of the world or the per, uh, perversion or perversionization, if that's a word, of the world, they don't see that as incorrect or problematic. They see themselves as the model of what humanity, if we want to call them humanity, I'm talking about humanity in general, is supposed to aspire to be. So they don't see any problem with the mental violation of other people, with the cultural violation of other people, with violating other people's um uh spirit so the the imperative it's it's part and parcel of who they are and it's as long as they are in the dominant position on this planet then they will continue to turn the world into them we will continue to be frustrated and either we will be able to create our own, we will nation build, be able to build, create our own where we can protect ourselves from them and stop them from doing this, or um, more and more of us will become more and more like them until attrition uh, removes any semblance of an African sense of morality or an African sense of eth- um, ethics when it comes to uh, sexual behavior. It will be whoever, whatever, whenever, however, whatever. Um, so the, the imperative is to, I guess, make the statement that this is not something that they see wrong, and therefore it is not something that they in any way, shape, form, or fashion feel compelled to stop. And those of us who are involved in this at a deep, committed, willful level um, follow in that line of thinking without understanding um, in the slightest way where it comes from. Our people are very serious about not being very serious. Yes. Absolutely. Meanwhile, white people are very serious about playing hardball (laughs) against us. And this hardball is called genocide. From Dr. Combo and Colin. Yes. Oh, absolutely. We know both him and Mama Maria Cambone and their son of Bodley Cambone dear very well. So, so his, his voice is always welcome. <laughs> <laughs> I concur. I, yeah. Well, we have to, what he 
And I guess he scares a lot of people because of how blatantly honest he is um, and how concise his analysis is. How It's so simple. We try to make things so complicated and do all of this super analysis of the situation. This is genocide. Um, this is cultural genocide, this is spiritual genocide, this is physical genocide. All these are acts to destroy African people. All this is a movement to erase the African mind from existence, from the possibility of any form of, of resurrection or being rebuilt or being reestablished in any future generation. Um, the the final stage, of course, is the, the, the physical uh Genocide, because when that's gone, well, there's no one to speak it or what have you. But um, when we look at the direction that uh, sex and sexual thought has taken in our community and has taken on a life of its own because things can be set up in such a way that, uh, a good example, when, when um, uh, Europe colonized um, African nations, they that you would end up with massive levels of destruction and infighting that was set up that way. It was made to happen that way. So they didn't stay. They could leave when they uh, were forced out or got good and ready to leave, and, of course, they could be angry or pretend to be angry about it. But when they, they left uh, chaos brewing and they left, uh, in many places, of people who attributed the negative behaviors in their society, the extreme negative behaviors in their societies to them, not to uh, the colonial state or to the people who had made this a norm. They attributed prostitution to themselves, and it did not exist before the arrival of the European colonists. So when this happened and then chaos begins to develop and blow up and wars and people are being killed left and right and they get tired of killing and then they call in the same people who set them up to come and save them. And that's very, not very similar, that's exactly um, what's going on here. We are, we are rationalizing our insanities as a natural human form which allows us not to look at the real source of the problem, the origin of the problem. We, it's, it's like we can't, we, we don't want to do the, 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 the real work of building from scratch out of our traditions. We, we, we want to um, take the shortcuts, which will allow us not to have to um, do the real work. So instead of having to really look at ourselves and look at our ancestors, we change who they are. We turn them into perverts. We turn them into homosexuals. We turn them into masturbators. We turn them into everything that the European has taught us that we are because we're trying to claim to be African. But in order to do that, we have to, in order to do that without relinquishing that which we have become as a result of being socialized in European society, we change our ancestors. We don't change ourselves, we don't do the work of changing ourselves. We don't do the work of defending our ancestors. We commit treason and kill our ancestors. And when we kill our ancestors, we kill ourselves. When we turn our ancestors into perverts, we turn ourselves into perverts. When we homosexualize our ancestors, we homosexualize um, ourselves. And that, in a very real sense, more than a real sense, is an act of genocide. If you uh, cannot kill... That's the one that the Amos Wilson was talking about. If you... Um, take away your memory or allow other people to take your memory away of who you are and you allow them to define you as they want to see you, as they want you to move forward, then you essentially have committed genocide against the ancestors who came before you and yourself because you are your ancestors. You've killed them and therefore you have killed yourself. So when we um, talk about the genocide, the genocide is in all of these areas. It's not just in the gunning down of people. It's also in the mental genocide, which in many cases uh, comes first. And then we, we take it on and we move forward with it in a way that reflects our genius, our genius being better than anybody else at whatever it is that we take on, including killing ourselves and killing our ancestors. Um, most of the fighting now 
over these issues is occurring between those people who have been educated or socialized by Europeans who look like us, who think like Europeans, who look like us, who are, I've come up with a, a term which isn't anything, you know, novel or fantastic, but I was in a, not a debate, I was um, really talking to some other people on a um, Facebook uh dialogue thing, and this brother who's from Harvard, he keeps trying to infuse that Africa, and this is a black guy, Africa is the origin of homosexuality, and homosexuality existed in Africa since the beginning of Africa. And I'm um, looking at how determined this individual is to rationalize this, and of course at the same time he's saying, well, I'm not homosexual, I'm not, I'm not homosexual, uh, which of course tears into the argument and undermines some people because that's the first logic of some people. Well, if you're defending homosexuality like this, then you must be homosexual. But if he is or not, to me there's no difference. So when it comes to individuals like that, I, I, I sort of label them promos. Um, I don't call them homos. I call them promos because they are pro promoting homosexuality while they are pretending not to be. And the worst of them look exactly like us. But this is not new for us. This, this this process of genocide, the production of Negroes who promote European sexual insanity, who prey on our children, who prey on our women, and they are our women. I'm, I think we talked about that before. They are our women who prey on our men. Um, these folks firmly believe that they are someone other than African or that they have redefined African in such a way that it fits the European ideal, that it fits European insanity. In fact, it fits the logic that Africans and Europeans are uh, the same. There's nothing morally or spiritually different between us, and the only problem now is that we're angry because we're not getting a larger uh, part of the spoils that Europeans are exploiting from everybody. So other than that, there's not supposed to be any difference between us and them, and I adamantly argue adamantly believe that there are some fundamental, the spiritual, cultural, social, um, biogenetic differences between Africans and Europeans that are going to be constant no matter what people do. Um, and the only way to change that, of course, is to put people in an environment where they can't be African, where there's nothing around them that teaches them how to be African, and everyone who they know, honor, respect is acting in a European fashion. Um, we, ha we have to, when we do this analysis, just like when we do any other analysis, it has to be an historical one. It also has to be an historical one. But first, and this is one of the few times I say we need to look at the Europeans first. When it comes to our children, study, what we need to learn, we need to look to ourselves first. But when it comes to how we have become something other than ourselves, we need to look to the European first. And that's not to say that there were not social conditions among African people in different places that did not allow this to be easily facilitated. It just means that this did not come from us because this is not what we were like. If, if you become something other than you, if, if you become infected with a disease or with a germ, then that G, disease or germ did not originate in you. In our it wasn't dormant in you. It was given to you from externally. It came into you externally. Now, you may come with time to accept that disease as a normal part of your being, but still, that doesn't make it come from you. And in fact, over many generations, it can maybe become part of a, a aspect of your biology, but that still doesn't mean that it originated with you, which means that it is not naturally and normally you. So when we are doing this, this analysis of sexual insanity, whatever aspect of it we want to look at, we have to do an historical analysis to see how things have changed. Just in this country, we don't even have to go immediately. We don't even have to go back to our traditions because those can be seen in so many ways among the Africans who were on the plantations and the Africans who were the free people during the Reconstruction period and after that. Most of the insanity that we see now occurred from the time of the Harlem Renaissance time forward, and it has picked up pace with time. 
So now what you see happening in our community, if things had continued at a relatively slow pace, wouldn't have occurred for another 70, 80 years. But what we're seeing now, we're, we're, we're seeing a massive homosexualization of the African population in the school system. People should see what's going on in the school system in a very short period of time. And this did not exist before. That, of course, is what these Negroes and promos and uh, homos are attempting to do is to make um, this seem like this was something that was always in our community, but because we were so backward, and, of course, the European had to come and correct us and teach us how to be forward, that we suppress our natural insanities. We suppress our natural homosexuality. We suppress our natural bestiality. We suppress our natural um, cheating propensity. We, we suppress these things because we didn't allow people to be their individual selves. And it took Europeans to come along and to show us um, what humanity was like for us to open ourselves up so that we could embrace that insane side. It's like it took um, European feminism to show um, African women who now claim to be feminists uh, that womanism was backward and, and uh, motherism was backward and that they needed to be against uh, men, not to work with them to nation build. So the historical analysis is critical. Uh, I remember, and uh, the wife is fond of, of talking about how um, back in the 40s and 50s and even in the 60s, how we considered ourselves to be, and it wasn't an arrogant feeling, but it was, in fact, it was a feeling of pity, if anything, how we considered ourselves to be the moral superiors of Europeans because of the insane sexual practices that they did. When we look at what they have been doing, um, we understand why we have gotten to this point. And part of the reason why it has taken us so long to get to this point is because it took us so long to be so well sub-integrated into European society. It took all of this time for them to get us, to break us to the point where we wanted to be them more than they, we wanted to be us, so that we were so self-hating that anyone who held out anything we would run to for some kind of validation. Um, there was a... Uh, all, all kinds of interesting points on this, but there was um, a number of the surveys that went on in the 70s, uh, Masters and Johnson and the Kinsey, I think it was the Kinsey Report, where they went and surveyed large segments of the population on their sexual behavior. Of course, we weren't part of that, but they surveyed, and it was interesting to me going back and looking over these as I was writing the sex imperative, along with a whole bunch of other stuff, you should see the dictionaries of sex that they have out here and what they have in these that has to be done by enough people to be and to be significant enough to be included in these dictionaries of sex. I don't ever want to have to read any of those again. And those were the slowest reads, I think, in my life because I could only take a page or two at a time. But when you look at these reports, they were asking each other about bestiality. Um, that was, to me, that was um, remarkable because most of us, even those of us who heard of the reports, were not aware of the kinds of questions that were being asked in there. We were just interested maybe in the cheating part and the dating part and the, the divorce and um, how many times people were having sex a, a, a day or a week or a month or what have you, um, so that we could begin to maybe move in their direction along those lines because those lines weren't so threatening to us. Um, but they had a whole collection of questions in there about bestiality, sex with animals. And they were even, got to the point that were in the discussion, they were even talking about what kind of animal was most preferred, where bestiality most occurred. And at that time, it most occurred in the rural area because most of the animals were in the rural area. I would suggest that that has changed now whether we're talking about in this country or we're talking about old Europe, England, France, all the rest of those places. Um, but what was most phenomenal to me in just that little area was that the uh, most popular animal to have sex with was the chicken. Most people, of course, caught, caught the sheep, and that, of course, there's a good reason and some science behind that for them. 
but the chicken was the most popular animal to have sex with. And the most popular way to do that was at the point of orgasm for the male was to ring, snap the chicken's neck. So they had a combination of sex and violence all in one thing against a creature that could not defend itself from them. So it's a, we have to know what they have been doing so that we can see what's going on and what's going to be next. Um, I tell people all the time who are wondering, oh, man, this is, this is a mess. And I say, you haven't seen anything yet because this is European culture. Europeans are returning themselves and everybody with them like they ever left, but they're bringing everybody with them into a new age form of their classic society. Greek society, Roman society, again, these were primarily homosexual societies, and the primary whole form of homosexuality in Greek and Roman society was a relationship between an adult male and a boy. They are moving us in that direction. If you want to see where we're going, if you're going to be in Asian society, if you're part of Arab society or wh whatever it is that you are following, if you want to know where they're taking you, then you need to look at them in what they call their classic society because classic means best when they were at their best, when they were doing um, most of who they were and they were celebrating it and they were the best at what they were at that time. And that's exactly where they're taking us. So folks are um, losing the um, excitement over the fight over homosexuality and they're beginning to look in the direction of pedophilia. And, of course, uh, these promo homos are um, trying to distance pedophilia from homosexuality, which, of course, is the next stage in our sexual development in this insanity, and they're one and the same. They cannot be separated in any meaningful way, and that's where it's going next. And when we look at the school system, when we look at the laws as they're being enacted in Europe, when we look at the practices that are going on in this country, when we're listening to the news, when we're seeing the number of rapes of boys, when we're just looking around and seeing what's happening with the children where you are removing every possible taboo, where you're moving every possible sense of insanity, then you can see clearly what's coming next. And we're not any more prepared for that than we were prepared when homosexuality began to really um, make its way into our community and be promoted by those voices that we listen to um, in our community. By the time that gets here, see, and this is it's, it's sort of like um, how, and I love to use this analogy, um, there is a, a frog, a, a big delicacy, um, and the, the legs off of this frog are primary parts eaten, but this, this frog is loved. But it, it emits a poison through its skin when it becomes afraid, like it's getting ready to get hurt or get killed. It emits a poison through its skin, which um, has a tendency to ward off predators. What um, these people did was that they would catch a lot of these frogs and they would put them into this vat, this huge vat, a pool-type apparatus, and they would slowly, very slowly, turn up the temperature in the water. And first the frogs would begin to get a little groggy because the water started to steam and it was really warm, you know, it starts to make you a little sleepy, blah, blah, blah. And they would turn it up until they were in this very groggy state. And they'd end up getting boiled in that water because it was a gradual warming up of the water where they didn't even recognize the changes in the temperature uh, I was going to say until it was too late, but they did never recognize it. This is what has happened to us. We, we have become part of a planned operation. And I'm not talking about people necessarily sitting around a table and saying, okay, we're going to do this this year, and 20 years down the road we're going to do this, and then 40 years later we're going to do this. This is a cultural conspiracy. This is a culture that sees itself as supreme and that needs to turn the world's people into it because then it will no longer be abnormal. So it is driven, uh, Francis Chris Wilson dealt with that so well, it is driven by the need to be normal, to be seen and accepted as um, a 
the average, if you will, but turning other people into it so that what it is becomes the world's average and it becomes the best image of it. It, be, it remains the expert um, in this, in this, and in this area. So it becomes a sheep or the wolf in sheep's clothing. Everybody else is a sheep, and they think that this wolf is a sheep. Um, so then this becomes a sexual play playground for these beings because everybody else is acting and thinking as they want them to, and it allows them easy access anywhere, anytime, anyhow. So this, this culture, this Asili, naturally moves them in this direction. So um, no one has to tell. <laughs> when when, when the, the, the riots, if you will, if you want to call it the rebellion, broke out in um, Azania, in Cape Town, um, the, no one had to tell any of the Europeans to go empty out the gun stores, which they did. No one had to tell them. There wasn't any conversations on the phone. They just immediately went and did what they know to do. The same thing happened with Rodney King. When the Rodney King decision came down, and folks went off, they immediately emptied out the gun stores. Immediately they emptied out the gun stores. There wasn't a conversation. Those are what you call indicators of a cultural conspiracy where this culture, and culture is a defense mechanism for the people who create it against people who they fear or hate, this culture moves people in such a way in terms of their thinking because they created this culture and this culture is them. It moves them in a way where they know to sexually train, sexually assault, sexually violate um, people who they are trying to turn into them. It's, it's, it's not a thought. That's where that imperative word comes in. It's not a thought. It's not a, it's not a consider, consideration. You just do it because you know that this is what you should do, not only because it is quote-unquote right, but because you know that this is the way to attack the spirit of these people. You're trying to break these people. You're trying to turn them into people who love, adore, worship, honor, will follow you um, straight into insanity and back. Um, so it's, it's when, we, when we're doing this analysis or when we're looking at the sex imperative um, of these people, a sex imperative which has become uh, the mainstay for a lot of us, uh, we have to understand how to do this correctly. We have to understand where the source is, who the source is, where it's coming from, where it originated from, where what gave life, what continues to feed it. And it's being fed by the mind of Europe. It's not being fed by anything else. It's being fed by the mind of Europe. Uh, context of white supremacy, I wanted to check... Uh, Justice, if you're there and you have some questions for Dr. Baruti, go right ahead. Your line should be uh, your line should be open. Um, how did you get your name? How do I get my well? Greetings, Justice. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Good. Good to hear your voice and name again. Um, I got my name in two ways. Uh, in Walimu which is key Swahili for a teacher, was given to me by somebody who I thought didn't like me. Um, when I started teaching college, um, there was a older sister who was in the sociology department with me, um, and she was my senior uh, faculty. And I had been teaching for, I guess, about four years. And she was a, a great student of African leaders, and some of the leaders had been called in Wallamu, and she walked by me one day, and she said, good job, Wallamu. And, of course, it pretty much floored me. As I said, I thought she didn't like me. Um, but to be called that by somebody of that magnitude, this, this uh, woman was, is extremely well-read, extremely well-traveled. She... She, uh, she, she has studied us as a people, so she was far ahead of me. And for somebody of that um, magnitude, at, at least in my eyes, to um, call me that, to assign that title to me, um, was was a, an enormous honor. Um, the other parts of my name, the the K stands for um, Kwabana, which is what some.
people call my Akan Day name. Uh, the, it, the names are given to people or um, based upon the days that they are born on because these days represent certain um, collections of characteristics, and the name matches that. Um, Bomani means um, warrior, and Baruti again means teacher, but this Baruti, that part of my name is a family name. So uh, my wife is also Baruti. My daughter is also uh, Baruti. And interestingly, all three of us are teachers. And Baruti, I believe I said Baruti stands for um, teacher also. But I guess that didn't necessarily what? fully answer your question. Um, we did some research and talked to some elders about the names, and that's how we got the other other three names. Okay. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. um, well, because I was just curious, though. Uh, <laughs> what helps you understand racism and white supremacy, and also what needs to be done to solve this problem? Wow. Um, what helps me to understand um, reading, um, talking with my wife, and talking to individuals like you and other folks in the community, older, much older, much older than me in many cases, who um, are conscious, who are trying to analyze the situation and figure out what's going on, who know our story. Um, who share things with me, share ideas with me. Um, all of the books I've ever written were based upon um, questions posed by people in the community. Um, so that dialogue is very important. Um, for me also, personally, reading is extremely important in this respect. People like um, Amos Wilson and Kobe Cambone and Francis Cress Wilson and Rumba Ni and the the Okotos and John Henry Clark, uh, all of these individuals who lived and who died for us, uh, many without virtually anything, Doc Ben, Chancellor Williams, I mean the, the list of, of the people who love us and whose writing reflects a love for us, a love for African traditions, um, those people have a major um, influence over um, my thinking in terms of how I um, look at this world and how I analyze this world and what I consider to be my responsibilities and drive to continue this work because I'm trying my best to be like them. Um, what do we do to solve this? Well, I think there, there are two things that um, people can do to solve. Well, uh, three things, really. The first, first thing is to realize that this is an extremely enormous problem. It is a huge problem, and it's going to take a long time for us to resolve this problem. Uh, recognizing that helps people not to become so impatient and to not uh, fall short or to quit before they have started, really even started doing their work. Um, knowing that something is extremely difficult from the beginning gives you the stamina to hang in there doing this work until... Um, you can't do this work any longer because you are mentally or physically unable. Um, the solution also for me is has two parts. It has an individual part and it has a group or community part. Uh, the individual has a responsibility to study our traditions, to study the Proverbs, which is a, is a, is a critical starting point because that tells you how you're supposed to think as an African person. That tells you what kind of stand that you're supposed to make. That tells you that you're not supposed to commit treason against your ancestors. It tells you that you're not supposed to compromise in, um, in any way um, relative to your children or the uh, people you're responsible for. Um, but also all of those other authors that I just named plus others. Um, we need to read these people. We need to study these people. We need to read them over and over again. And, you know, everybody's not the greatest reader in the world. So, I mean, to pick up 
one book, depending upon what it is, that can lead you totally in the right direction. And maybe another book in another few years. Um, but also the building of African family. It doesn't take away from your biological family, but the building of African family, of people who really think like you, who think in a revolutionary um, fashion, who want to change African people, who want to nation build, who are pan-Africanists in their thought, in their orientation, to build a collective of them in what I call centers, because you're not going to find a whole bunch of folks like that, but there's a, enough so that you all can support each other, can work together, can create um, independent ways of doing things, can walk and talk and act like our ancestors did and like we should because we are our ancestors, to work with those individuals to build community is critical because people are doing that in these little communities all over the world. And as that gets stronger and that grows, then they tend to come together. That's how you begin the process of forming a nation. That's how you um, nation build. Wow. Um, <clears throat> um, thank you for some of the answers. I really appreciate it. Um, mm -hmm. How did you come up with the name of your book, The Sex Imperative? Um, well, uh, that allowed me to say a little more about that. Um, the book was written uh, really a few years after we started the, the homeschooling program here. And, of course, when you're a teacher, if, if you have an independent um, setup, then you can have more personal conversations with your students. Um, they really get to know that you do love and care about them, and then they um, have a, a sense of trust where they can tell you more about what's really going on in their world. And I'm listening to um, our students, and they're telling me things that are going on around them um, that I know that their parents are not aware of in any way, shape, form, or fashion, and I asked them to bring me the worst of the CDs and the most common CDs and the, the CDs that are being sold on the street, the ones that don't make it to the store, the ones that everybody is, is buying, and they're bringing me these things, and I'm listening to them, and I'm saying, this is insanity, and I didn't realize how deep it was. I had maybe a better idea than some, but I really didn't realize just how um, deep it was. So the... Um, I, I wanted to do two things. I wanted to talk to um, young folks, teenagers who were willing to read and think outside of the box about what they were seeing around them. And since then, of course, I've run into a number who have said, you know, thank you for, for doing this. I, I thought it was just me. I thought that um, I should be doing this like everybody else, but... Um, I knew that it was wrong, and I just needed to hear this from somebody else, even if it was, you know, an old person. Um, and also it was written for the parents um, and the guardians and the older sisters and brothers and the aunts and the uncles and the grandparents who are not aware of what's going on with the children in our community. Um, so the... Uh, it's not just the title to me, it's also the cover. If somebody is willing to pick up the book and they start reading the wording that's on the cover that's, that's talking about the things that are discussed in the book, then it will have the possibility of pulling them um, or making them want to at least do a little reading in the book, and then they may discover uh, a truth that they hadn't considered um, otherwise. Of course, the word imperative, which we were talking about earlier, to earlier um, implies that this is um, something that we need to urgently deal with and that it is um, something that is uh, planned, whether it's a cultural planning or group planning or individual planning, but we know that it is it is planned and that it is moving fast and that it is needs to urgently be attended to. 
right. Thank you. That'll be all for now. Thank you very much. Good to talk to you again. Okay. Take care. Um, Dr. Baruti, uh I wanted to ask, um, you in your book, you touch on the connection between sex and violence uh, between uh, that, that permeates European culture, white culture. And what I wanted to address specifically was I have concluded that practicing racism is sexually arousing for white people, Europeans. And I feel like a, a classic illustration of that is so-called uh, lynchings, where even the terms, uh, they, they call a lynching a hanging, or they say a black person was hung. Uh, we use the same term, hung, that connotes uh, large male genitalia. We use that same term to reference killing a black person, normally involving castration, and is generally associated with something to do with you thought about or you looked at a white person. Um, can you touch on that connection between sex and violence? And if you think, just from your observation, practicing racism is sexually arousing for white people, Europeans? Absolutely. I don't, I don't think that there is a disconnect between sex and violence at all at various levels, whether it's an actual sexual act, as in um, the worst-case scenario, uh, rape, um, to uh, just getting a, quote-unquote, emotional high from doing this, which is sexual arousal for, for them. And when you were talking about that, of course, the lynching and the removing of the male genitalia, I'm sure, which is still in alcohol and bottles in a lot of people's houses in the South, um, I immediately thought about the Inquisition, which, of course, if we see what they do to their own, then we know what they will do to us. Um, in the Inquisition, uh, thousands of European women were killed by European men. They were sexually assaulted, they were raped, they were killed, they were burned, they were cut, and this provided a major sexual outlet. It wasn't just about returning um, European women to their lowly position. It provided a sexual outlet for European males, for European people, for the European nation. Um, we will often talk here about the... Um, Europeans' inability, natural inability to feel anything in terms of emotion, emotional content. In fact, one of the major um, uh, missions of European media is to teach Europeans how to better show emotion or to um, um, imitate or to pretend emotional content. Um, when you when you talk, well. I guess a, a very good example of that in terms of them revealing themselves has to do with serial killers. Um, every one of the shows that I've seen that's dealing with people who systematically kill in the end, and their truth does come through in their quote-unquote fiction, uh, in the end these killers were getting some kind of sexual gratification from killing people. And whether they engaged in sexual violation of these people or not, is was not a determining factor of whether they got sexual satisfaction out of that. It was a sexual satisfaction that came from the uh, from the killing of this person. The sexual satisfaction that comes from rape. It's not just about violence and domination. It's also about the sexual control of another individual. To be able to, um, I talk about your 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 body is the most sacred thing that you have. You know, people can violate your house, they can violate your car, they can they can violate your bank account, they can but for someone to touch your body without your permission is the ultimate absolute violation, the ultimate absolute sexual high for Europeans. Um so it's like every aspect of of their reality evolves around sex. And you, you know, you, you, you can even ask the question, what percent of each person's time each day is spent on thinking about sexual conquest or sexual um, encounters? The amount of rape that had to have occurred 
during our enslavement, in order for us to have acquired the range of skin color that we have in our community today, when the vast majority of enslaved Africans came from West Africa, in the area of Ghana, expanding in a little bit, but in that general area, where the African people are dark. We're dark when the African, when the Europeans arrive, and for the most part today are still very dark people. And I mean that, of course, in a very positive way. So the level of rape, the amount of rape that had to continuously occur had to have been phenomenal, had to have been beyond our wildest imagination. I remember reading... Um, one sister's work, and she said, if you reach the age of, I believe it was 12, it might have been 9, but I think it was 12, in, on a plantation, and you hadn't been raped yet, and something was physically deformed or something so horribly distorted or ugly about you that no one wanted to touch you. And I myself sort of doubt that after reading the books, the dictionaries of sex, where that in and of itself, the ugliness of the person, according to European standards, is sexually exciting. If in answering that question, um, I would put into your hand one or two of these dictionaries of sex, and um, or part of that question, because it there's no area that is not sexually enticing to Europeans, or they have not turned into a fetish or some kind of sexual um, enticement, and they sex is a tool. That, like I say, the the, the the European penis was the first biological weapon against African people, against people of color. That was the first biological weapon that was used against us by them. Um, this is a form of domination and control because in the European mind, to control somebody in sex is to control them absolutely. Like I said, that's, that's the greatest violation that there is. And to them, this speaks to or confirms, um, validates their power, their supremacy. So for them to be, and then to take it a step further, when you have people's minds so contorted that they come to you to be voluntarily raped, they will marry you, they will sleep with you, they will do whatever with you, they'll talk about how fine you are, what have you, and voluntarily go to be raped because you have their mind so messed up that they think that you are human, and we have to understand the definition of what human is in our traditions, according to African people, um, then to me that is the absolute statement of racism. That is the closest thing that you can do. You can Taking somebody's skin off with a whip is quite different than sexually violating them because you tear into their mind in a, in a way that nothing external can do, nothing from a distance can do. And to be able to dominate a people sexually and to turn them into your sexual toys, that's an absolute form of white supremacy. That's an exercise of white supremacy. That is a demonstration in their minds of white supremacy. Um, how do you say sex as conquest mm. the method by which sex conquest occurs okay. sex by conquest or conquest by sex however you want to phrase it it's the same same thing wow wow what I wanted to do because um, you, you already talked about the way a lot of this sexual perversion can be looked at or treated as a game or as though it's something funny, um, entertainment frequently. I have an image uh, attached on the front page of Blog Talk Radio describing this show, uh, and it's with a white woman, and she's kissing a dog. Uh, They're in some sort of uh, sexual relationship. This is in a cartoon uh, and then uh, the sound clip I played at the beginning of the program, I want to play this again uh, just so everybody gets the opportunity to hear it. And I would like you to comment on how this sexual perversion, uh, including the mistreatment of children, pedophilia, 
rampant in uh, European culture. If you can listen to this sound clip and kind of share your thoughts on uh, how this sexual perversion is uh, being wielded even against young children. This sound clip is, uh, should be really quick. Um, here we go. Do you know who I am? No. Well, if you knew who I was, then you would know what I'm going to do with you if you don't tell me what I need to know. Maybe, but I don't know who you are. Do you know what kind of damage a steel boot can do to prepubescent testicles? How would I know that? Tell me where the target is before I kick you in the nuts! Get the man off of me! I'm a proud American! Damn it! I knew this great country was gonna go... Take the sandwich bag once that bean pot just became commander in chief. Do you want me to kick you in the nuts? No. Do you want me to kick you in the nuts? No. Do you want me to... Wait, Jack. I do not want you to kick him in the nuts. Um, context of white supremacy. Again, that was from the uh, from the boondocks from two weeks ago. A, a cartoon. A mm -hmm. cartoon. Can you talk about how a lot of this sexual perversion being marketed to children and involves the abuse of children? Oh, wow. Children are the primary target. Um, the, the, the logic is simple. Um, you don't even worry about the adults. Well, you worry about the adults to the extent that you can separate them from the children in terms of control. And that's been done through spoilage, through uh, laws, regulations that do not allow um, people who have accepted them as the law to discipline the children, which is the majority of us. Um, the whole goal, of course, was to access our children. As I said before, the sex revolution of the 70s was about white women. The sex revolution going on now, if you want to call it a revolution, is targeting our children. Um, you know that if you can get to the children separated from their parents and separate them from themselves and from their story and um, give them another story and give them another interpretation of reality, then they become you automatically. You don't have to worry about the adults. And those children, that being all they know, they will teach that quote-unquote truth to their children. And then pretty soon who they really are is, is completely and totally lost. So the children are the main um, target. And, of course, the introduction of so much violence into children's television and so much gender confusion into the actors and the voices who are playing in these different shows. I am told that SpongeBob is the worst at this particular point in time. Um, but the infusion of just ideas. Europeans know all you got to do is just inject one little idea, one little thought, one little word into the mind of children and then in this world in this reality there are so there are so many there are so many examples before um, I talk about that anymore I think about a uh, cartoon that um, one of my sisters in Florida who is um, very critical and astute on the uh, perversion that is invading our community and European sheep found this, this cartoon and she sent it to me and it is uh, I think it's entitled something like You in the Future and it's got this, the first pictures of this little boy, little white boy in a room and he's looking at this poster about space travel and then the next cartoon, this space, I guess, time ship, you know, sort of appears uh, in his room, you know, he says, you know, wow and then this um, guy gets out of the spaceship one of who is I'm, from the way it's worded, apparently it's him in the future. And the little boy asks him, you know, what am I going to be um, in the future? And the the, the guy says, you're going to be a pedophile. And the scene is of the guy who's come from the future locking the door. We have to understand the systematic wow. nature at which children are being assaulted. And when the children no longer have guardians, we've got a population where the vast majority of African parents are afraid to confront the insanity, the war that's being waged against their children. So when you have such a situation, when you have parents who have relinquished power and therefore the children have no respect for their parents because they know that they're not being protected, Children know that they're not being disciplined. They know that there's no order in their lives. They know this, and they're constantly looking for it, and they find it in the worst of places because those are the places that are put up in their eyes for them to go for 
this order, to go for these definitions, to go for this re reality. You have, I've seen people have sent me so many videos on Facebook and to, to directly to me um, of little children, five, four, three, six, seven, eight, uh, doing the grinding dances with their parents filming them and applauding them and pushing them up against other children so that they can practice it the right way. These are their parents. These are their parents. So you have a society that pushes sexual excess. These children have no idea what it is, what's, what's going on. They just are following whatever it is that's supposedly cool. You have, and, and again, I keep coming back to the fact that it is not the children. The children do not raise themselves. Children are supposed to be raised, or better yet, reared by their children, by their parents, and the parents have dropped the ball because of their fear of white supremacy. And it's a well-grounded fear in many ways. In the back of all of our minds, we know that Europeans will kill for nothing, especially if they want our children, then we had better let them go, or we might end up dead. So we try to make that transference of them from our children to their children as easy on our mind and our consciousness as possible. Um, but our children know. And when they, when they have removed the parents' The, the parents' belief that they can do anything about this, then they go to work. How are you going to put your child in a classroom with a black male who's flaming, and this is a little eight, nine-year-old boy, and leave him with this boy, with this, this, this adult male, in after school, leaving these children in the care and company of these individuals who you know, number one, you know how they got to be who they are, and you know that they see your children as sexual prey, and you leave them with them. What is the child to think? What's the child to believe? He's, he's, he, he or she is still supposed to accept that their parents are protecting them. The number of children who are being raped, both male and female, is going up dramatically. It is going up in unbelievable numbers. And the ones who aren't telling is probably going up at twice the rate. So it's, 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 we now have the, if you will, the first or really the second generation of children who have been systematically raped who believe that this is the normal and natural process in society who have become mentally pedophiles and who hunt their own. This is the, we're working on deeply moving into the second generation of this, and because they have become so numerous, because they have been so well paid by white supremacy, and because they have, in many cases, the church behind them. The three quote-unquote African-centered churches here in Atlanta are all pro-homo. One of them was carrying my books, and when that one came out, the homos went off here in Atlanta, and they removed all of my books from their store. Couldn't take them on consignment anymore. So the movement within these organizations, how well and how well supported these organizations are, how well their arguments are developed in academia, in layland, if you will, all over the place. So you have parents who, even those who know better, are not willing to take a stand with their children against this insanity which, of course, leaves the children who are operating in a world that is pro-homo, that is pro-perversion, that is pro-sexual excess, that is pro-extreme individualism, that is pro-pleasure, pro-hedonism, um, pro-instant pro gratification, pro-oral, pro-anal, pro-whatever it is that Europeans are doing, pro-bestiality, pro-anything. These children are walking into a world that's giving them instructions that is leading them 100% against their ancestors. I mean, what is a child to think in this world? No protection, and everybody they know or everybody pretending to know them is involved in this insanity in one way, shape, form, or fashion. And to... And also to be brought up in a world where you have been spoiled to the point where you are so weakened 
that you are so needy for attention from anybody that this is used against you if you don't um and this this is a world this is amazing in this world if you don't uh let me do this to you if you don't do this to me then I'm not going to be your friend anymore or you're not going to be cool to know that the most important one of the most important thing the most important thing for so many of our children today is to become rich and famous to be somebody to now have generations of children and children producing children who have so little self-esteem, so little sense of value for themselves. They're so needy for attention for somebody else. They're so empty inside that they believe that they have to become somebody as if they were born nobody. And this society moves them, this cultural conspiracy of white supremacy moves them to believe that unless they are rich and famous, and when we also know that in order to be rich and famous, then you have to play the game. And the game requires you to do all kinds of things that ordinarily you wouldn't do, and then you have to do that to other people and rationalize that as normal because you have to defend yourself or lose your mind. So they are in a world that is... 100% against their sanity, but they have to survive in that world, a world where there is almost no trust, or maybe for some there is no trust, a world where people sexually violate you at will if you don't have power, if you're not rich and famous, and of course that's how you got there in many cases, in a world where you have still even with all of the quote-unquote history that's been brought to our attention, the hour story that's been brought to our attention, you still are nobody because you still look at Africa as the last place in the universe that you want to claim having come from. So you still have no identity. You still are no one except what they turn you into. Your history, your story, our story began with them. So you still are nobody. And your sole and most important goal in life is to become a so much a part of this society that nobody recognizes the color of your skin, that nobody recognizes your African features, that you become an invisible person. That is, that is the most wonderful thing that could happen to many of our children because this hatred of what we look like, of who we are, of who we came from, is so strong. So whatever... Is it is that these other beings are doing whatever it is that is being promoted that will give you some identity, that will make you into somebody. That's the direction that you go. The studies show most prostitutes were sexually violated as children. Most homosexualized males were raped or were sexually assaulted as children. We know this. So this can give us some insight into what's coming based upon what's happening to our children today. Um, In Homosexuality and Affiliation of African Males, I talked about the number of rapes that are occurring of our children and in the prison system um, today. At that time, at the time that I wrote that book, uh, the Department of Justice had over 4 million officially registered um, pedophiles, over 4 million officially registered. And then you start talking about pedophiles who have an average um, career record of sexual assaults, assaults somewhere between 70 and like 300 and something. Now, those 70 or 300 something, this is exponential growth. They are creating classical European society through us. They are creating classical European society through anyone who they can force under them, culturally, materially. And now that we're moving into generations of this, we are a greater vanguard in pushing this agenda forward than they are. And we stop telling our children who they were and who their story is along with the spoils and giving them the 
room and, and giving them their personal freedoms and all that. Like, I didn't have them. Like, you didn't have them. And this is allowing someone else to socialize them and give them a whole completely different interpretation of reality that allows them to remain on top, to remain the dominant life form, to remain the dominant sexual predator on this planet, and we applaud that. We applaud that. So our, 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 the assault against our children is um, the most important indicator, the absolute most important indicator of the level to which supremacy is becoming um, a normalized fact of life, but it's a supremacy of the culture where we're not connecting the supremacy with the people themselves. We're, we're, we're because of this, we're all human um, nonsense is taken completely and totally out of political context. Maybe we are. I'm not going to argue with that at this moment. Maybe we are. But that still, in no way, shape, form, or fashion, undermines the politics that um, exists among and between the different groups of people. It doesn't change that at all. The supremacy um, can continue to exist regardless of whether um, we recognize that we're, quote, unquote, all human or not. One thing technically doesn't have anything to do with the other. And the children, of course, are the ones who will bring this in, usher this in. It's, it's, it's almost like um, uh, having, um, kill, almost like, it, it is having killers raise our children, and the killers have killed us, the adults, the parents, and they're now raising our children, and our children know that they are killers, and their greatest aspiration is to also become killers like them. So they walk around practicing what they do. Our children are the ticket. They are the key. Context of white supremacy. Uh, our guest is fourth visit on the program, Dr. Mawalimu K. Baruti. Uh, please visit the website, uh, akobenhouse.com, A K. O B E N House dot com. Uh, Justice, did you have some other questions that you wanted to ask Dr. Burry? What are some? Um, y y yes, I do have some questions. Uh, what are some suggestions of how to talk to non white people about racism and white supremacy without getting them upset? Okay, could you ask that again, please? Sure. Mm -hmm. What are some suggestions of how to talk to non-white people about racism, white supremacy, without getting them upset? <laughs> that was a good question, because uh, sometimes it's not possible not to get them uh, upset. And uh, one of the things that we talk to or have talked to with our students here over the years, is that you have to be um, somewhat of a, of a good judge of people's personality and characteristics based upon their body movement and um, eyes, what they're doing, and, and, and how they respond to things to learn who you can and cannot talk to about this. I like to say there are some people who do not have the capacity to understand, not because they don't have the, 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 the enough gray matter or brain to do this. It's just that their mental side, their, their brain has been um, killed to the degree that they can't even consider the possibility of what you're saying as being real, so they're naturally going to rebel, and they're going to rebel in a way that goes against you. Um, for me, over the years, the best way that I have found is that and when I engage people who who want to think, I don't engage people who don't want to think, who don't want to learn, who don't want to understand, who don't want to consider the possibility of white supremacy. I'm not going to waste my time. I was warned against that by um, elders, and they said the stress from that will kill you because you have people who will engage you in dialogue and debate about white supremacy, and they're only doing it so that they can distract you from your work. You're not going to change their mind. You're not going to make them think any deeper. Their whole job 
the whole purpose for engaging you in the discussion in the first place is to try to find ways to find holes in your argument. They're not thinking about what you're saying, really, other than to try to find a way to undermine it, to to, to call it into question. Um, but for those people who I have found who have that genuine curiosity, and there are quite a few who have never considered, never thought about it, never, but they have um, maybe been listening to the news or seen incidents that don't make sense or they can't explain. Um, when you um, talk to people, you have to give them examples of contradictions in what happens in society that has to do with race over and over and over again. And it's, it's not something that you browbeat people with. Okay, you see them one time or see, see this see this sister one time and, and you're talking about something and, and she says something that calls uh, would would cause you to say, okay, well, she just doesn't understand that this is white supremacy, and you use that as an example to show a contradiction where this is a consistent thing among European people. This has consistently happened to him. Why why are you getting upset about um, this guy getting lynched in this way? I mean, this is a part and parcel of how they've been dealing with us for um, a long time. Um, Often this requires uh, will require a lot of commonsensical thinking on um, your part. There, there are people who don't know that Europeans went out and colonized the world, but there's evidence all around in the names of places. I was talking to the students earlier today. The Philippine Islands, named after Philip. Uh, Georgia, named after King George. All of these things that people are not aware of, them, aware of that make them stop and think, because you can't make someone understand white supremacy. Nobody could make you understand white supremacy. That's supremacy. That's an understanding you had to come to of your own um, accord um, because there were ideas that were placed before you that you did some thinking about and you came to the same logical conclusion or similar uh, logical conclusion to whoever it was that was um, conveying that information to you. Um, so you have to find if if there's someone who um is to be convinced and we do have a job we do have a um an obligation to bring things to people's attention but once we brought that to their attention then they have to begin to do the mental work themselves to to um discover to see to look for to analyze to question what have you the contradictions um, that are presented in by the supremacist culture that pretend that it's not supremacist. All you can do is give them an idea here, an idea there, and keep on going on with the conversation and let that thought take its natural course in their brain. Either it's going to be tossed into the garbage heap or it's going to stay at the forefront of their mind and it's going to become part of their, their analysis. Okay, um, that, um, that'll be all for now. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Uh, we have quite a few folks that uh, called in. I wanted to check the phone lines to see if uh, people had questions. Um, is that all right, Dr. Bree? Yes, we can definitely oh, okay. do that. Okay. Um, person that called in from a block number, did you have a question? Yes, that's me, 818. Greetings, Dr. Baruti. Glad to have you on the program again. Thank you. Good to be here. I have a few questions. Um... I'll 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 take them, you know, after I'll ask them. Um, okay. One, do you know, I, I've never heard that about them having uh, black male genitalia in liquor bottles. Is there any, are there any books where that's documented? Okay. Um, okay. Now, I, when I said alcohol, I didn't mean like rum or scotch or whiskey. I'm okay. talking about as a preservative, like in a biology class. And are there any books or anything where that's documented where we can find that? Oh, um, let me see. Um, Dale Jones talks about it. Um, wow, I'd have to think for a second. Um, Without Sanctuary is a good book that has a lot of pictures of lynching. Um, that's a very, in fact, we show that to the students um, all the time. And uh, I hate to sound, I guess, unofficial on this, but those are that's like one of those little facts that you have to read books like uh Kobe Cambone's um African Black Psychology and other books that that specifically deal with us um 
where these little tidbits are included in the discussion um, of that. I can't give you one, I'm thinking now, I can't give you one specific book where that is detailed um, to any measurable degree in terms of, but it's it's common knowledge among African-centered scholars that the genitalia of African men, Francis Gress Welsing talks about that in ISIS papers, where the genitalia of, of black of African men was the most sought out souvenir by European men and European women at lynchings. Um, when you look at the pictures in Without Sanctuary, one of the things that you will notice is that um, most of the black males who have been lynched, their pants are down or their pants have been opened. And in some cases you can see the dark stains from the blood where the genitalia was cut off. But in terms of there being a book that specifically only talks about that or has a major chapter on that, I'm, uh, it's not ringing a bell right now. Uh, hang tight, 818. I want to see because um, we have a, a very full line, but hang tight. I'll make sure uh, if you had another part to the question. Um, person who called in 7908, 7908, did you have a question for Dr. Burdi? Last four digits, seven nine. Oh, okay, no problem. Thank you for listening in, sir. I appreciate it. Um, person who called in, last four digits, four three seven two. Did you have a question? Four three seven two. Right now. Oh, okay. Thank you for listening. I appreciate it. Um, person who called in, last four digits, five one two eight. Five one two eight. Do you have a question? No, Gus, thank you. Just listening. Great show. Oh, right on. Thank you for listening, sir. I appreciate it. Um, Mr. Nero, uh, did you have a question, Mr. Nero? Greetings, Dr. Maruti. Greetings. How are you doing? How are you, sir? I'm I'm doing wonderful. How are you doing? Uh, I'm a little less confused today than I was yesterday. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> well, I say welcome to the club. Me too. <laughs> it gets clear with time. Yeah, that that response came after listening to one of the pals' episodes. A Gentile commonly called white person asked me how I was doing. So, Gus had given me some clarity that day. So, <laughs> uh, my question, sir, I want to play uh, devil's advocate mm-hmm. because I know black people don't listen to some of this and just kind of blow it off. So mm-hmm. let me ask you this question, sir. Okay. What do you say to those critics that says, well, Dr. Rudy, homosexuality and bestiality and pedophilia, at the end of the day, sir, those are just ideas. Mm-hmm. And the fact that I have freedom of thought and can think in such a broad range suggests mm-hmm. that I am superior to you Africans who can only think inside the box. Well, you're really playing devil's you advocate. <laughs> you're really playing the devil's advocate. <laughs> it is um, to me. I would say that that is the would be the correct mentality for the European mind. That is the kind of response that I would expect um, from a mind that is European or Europeanized um, in terms of the individual priority. Um, our traditions. As African people, even though we were um, people who significantly appreciated individualism or individuality, which is uh, the opposite of that, is a lie that um, European scholarship has um, passed on to us as being the truth that we were um, so caught up in the, the being ruled by the group that it was sort of like bees in a hive and we didn't think for ourselves, which is the opposite of the truth. We prioritize things in a very different way. The individual is not the most important thing on the planet. African people are very family-oriented, are very child-oriented, very child-centered um, people traditionally in the ancient society as well. So if that being the case and that being the framework out of which we saw human relations, um, also being great respecters of the universe and studies of the universe. So when we studied these things, it gave us a framework out of which to create reality, to create culture, to create society. And the things that are um, that were just mentioned, the bestiality, all those things, those are not a natural part in the order of things. 
Um, that is now a natural part uh, in the order of animals. And when Europeans would come up with an occasional example of this or an occasional example of that to prove an absolute, such as like here in the, the Atlanta Zoo, the silverback gorillas, they will um, occasionally perform a homosexual act. But the silverback gorillas are not in a natural environment, and these acts are just like Europeans in the caves that were designed to establish a pecking order among the males. And that is the only avenue, the only means that they have to do that without bringing harm to each other so that they can still hunt in packs. Um, these things could not have been a natural part, even though they were possible. I'm very sure that uh, medical doctors in our um, story, um, in Kemet, in Ghana, Mali, so all of these societies going back were, were quite aware, based upon the human body, that a penis could be inserted inside of a rectum. Um, that would be obvious in many cases from the size of feces that comes out of some people's anuses. Um, but they understood that this was not a correct thing to do. Just because it's understood as a possibility, as a physical possibility, does not mean that it's supposed to be embraced. That, of course, would be the case in a society where there are no morals or morals are regulated by individuals or by whoever is in power or ethics in the same um, uh, way. So uh, I, I would agree that as individuals, all kinds of things are possible, but I think that our ancestors were wise enough to know what we should or should not do in, to order, in order to maintain universal order or the order of the universe within the communities and the relationships of people. Um, pedophilia, of course, being the most extreme. If you are a child-centered, child-loving um, community and children are at the center of everything that you do, um, the process and the rituals that African people went through um, to prepare for, to get pregnant, to have children, to uh, rear children, to focus on the child's character more than anything else from birth forward indicates that pedophilia was not something that could have possibly um, come into existence in traditional African society because that would have defeated that purpose. Pedophilia, child violation, child sexual violation, child violation, period. So that's not something that I could imagine coming into the minds of African people, even though I'm sure that people were aware that a penis could go into an anus, just like a branch could go into an anus, or in some cases today, a fist and a whole arm up to the elbow can go into an anus. But that was not part of their way of thinking because they were following a natural order of things. Great answer, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, non Mightyway, did you have a question for Dr. Baru? Non Mightyway? Uh, okay, just listening. Okay. Um, I wanted to ask, um, before I check back with 818, I wanted to ask you in your book, you talk about the concept of unisexualization. Can you explain what that means uh, and how this is a tool or how you think this is going to evolve in the system of white supremacy? Well, it's when I'm talking about um, unisexualization, I'm talking about a, a global um, process. And it, it wouldn't make a difference if it was unisexualization or heterosexualization or homosexualization. Uh, homosexualization, of course, is closer to heterosexualization. You're talking about um, molding the world in such a way that people follow your sexual appetites. And because you are defining what these are and you have established this order, you will constantly be at the head of the pecking order. You will be at the top of the pecking order. You will be able to do to whoever what you want to do. Mama Rumba Ani, um, in a very interesting article, she talked about the concept of progress, where Europeans have defined um, progress as this constant movement in any direction, but as long as it is 
a constant movement, and as long as they are in control of or at the head of that direction, then they remain in charge. It doesn't make a difference if the direction is destructive or productive or what have you, but as long as it is a change, as long as it is a technological change, and they are at the head of it, then they are defined as the supreme beings because they are the ones who are running the show. They are the ones who are directing this progress, even if it's not somewhere that they necessarily want to or care where it's going. Um, unisexualization is really the end result of, um, or if you will, a greater classical Greek and Roman society where there is no um, given uh, preference or norm for relationships. Um, Self-sex or homosexual sex or heterosexual sex or orgies or combinations or bestiality, whatever it is, you as an individual, the point that was just well made um, in in terms of being the devil's advocate, that, that point speaks to that extreme individualism which um, produces that unisexual uh, mind. There There is no, there are no guidelines. There are there are no um, there is no order um, except disorder. But it is an ordered disorder. So that allows you to still remain on the cutting edge, and it re- allows you to remain on the cutting edge because you are defining what is sexually or asexually appropriate, and you are um, seen as the expert, as the one who's moving people in the correct direction. You are the one who is opening people's eyes and saving their minds and making them realize their own individual potential by participating and practicing in these insanities. And what we have to remember in that respect is that once you become involved in these things, once you become willfully involved in these things, then you become the greatest defender of them. It becomes part and parcel of who you are, and you continue to pick up the pace and move in the direction of these insanities because they overwhelm you. Um, we have to understand why things like homosexuality is, is not just a individual act among African people or uh, pedophilia. It moves you closer in so many ways to how European thinking is done how it occurs, how it works, what is it is about. You move closer and closer to the mind of Europe, and you rationalize with each stage, with each step, that as being the normal way for you to be. Therefore, you are validating European culture as supreme. If you are following something, that's the same thing I say when I say African people are so integration, or rather sub-integration oriented, where when, when you want to integrate with something or you want to um, become a part of something else, then it's because that is seen as better than what you have. It is seen as superior to what you have. So we are aspiring to be like them in every possible way. And when you are aspiring to be like someone else because you see them as superior to you in so many ways, then morality, your, your morals and ethics um, get put to the side if you're going to become them, if you're going to change who you are to become them, if you're going to forget who you are intentionally, if you're not going to pass that on to your children, then the morals and the ethics of what they do or what they don't do or what constitutes success for them, which is what you're really looking for, um, the, the the morality of it, that's that's got to go out the window because that prevents you from becoming that extreme individual. So the, the 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 process, not the process, the the um, hierarchy, the um, pyramid of supremacy on this planet, as established by European science, automatically has them on top. The 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 science of evolution automatically places them on top because it's based on the logic of the last being the best, if you will, um, the survival of the fittest, and because they are in charge, and obviously they are the best. That's the logic that fits that, regardless of whether it's incorrect or correct. That logic, that science fits their mind, just like so many other theories fit the mind of the European. And those are the theories that are promoted. You can prove anything. People say, no, you can't. Yes, you can. They proved for many, many years that African people were their intellectual inferiors during our enslavement. 
They scientifically proved this. They had all kinds of theories and had the world believing this for the most part. Okay, so that was quote-unquote proven. We know that it wasn't proven, but in terms of the science that we are dealing with, this was not in question. This was pretty much a fact by the vast majority of people on this planet. Okay, so if they can, and they're doing the same thing now with homosexuality as being originating on the African continent. And we are, many of us are about the business of proving that correct, just like many of us were about the business and still are about the business of demonstrating that Europeans are our intellectual superiors. I see it every day online. But we have so many people, particularly people in this leadership positions, who are bending over backward to demonstrate the superior logic of the European. And even if it's not specifically in reference to a European, then it's in reference to how Europeans do things, or the European economy, or European politics, or European religion, or European family dysfunctionality. These are seen as the norm and the only or the best way for us to do them. So that's to say that we still see them as the supreme beings, because they are the model. Mm -hmm. Wow. Uh, let me check really quick. Justice, did you have uh, some more questions you wanted to ask Dr. Baruti? No, just a moment, thank you. Okay. okay. I wanted to get your comment, and I'm going to check with 818. I wanted to get your comment because uh, in the book, The Sex Imperative, mm -hmm. you talk about the concept of mental rape. And I wanted to see if there was a correlation between that idea of mental rape and what's been playing out in the media over the last few weeks with uh, Lawrence Fishburne's daughter, Montana Fishburne, and her being uh, in a uh, pornographic video with uh, two suspected white supremacists, and if that in any way relates to your idea of mental rape. Oh, abs abs absolutely, but in a different um, way. When I was talking about um, mental rape, the primary... And they are related, but the primary thing that I was talking about, because um, ideas, they expand to fit into other areas. I was specifically talking about um, the act of masturbation that has seeped into our community over the years where images have to be drawn forward in the mind in order for this act to occur for most people who um, do masturbate. So they're taking images of girls and women who are their friends, who are their sisters, who are their mothers, who are somebody who they know, somebody who wouldn't want to be bothered with them, et cetera, et cetera, and they are mentally raping these individuals. That's just another form of this rape process. Um, that's what I really meant in, well, in a nutshell about mental, mental rape. But when, for me, that would fit more into... Um, with Fishburne's daughter, that would fit more into the um, idea of volunteer rape, where um, you, in all probability, have not been taught who the rapists are and what has been done to you and your people, crimes that are not forgivable and for which there should never be a statute of limitations on. And you have either rejected that lesson, or you have never been um, taught that lesson. Um, we also have to look to the parents when we are assessing this, because often the parents demonstrate a model that's geared toward a form of success which promotes anything as a means of, of um, success. But the volunteer rate is when you are not aware or you don't want to know, and you go to people who have systematically destroyed your people, pretending that they are not the same people. The Kotos talk about that in the Sankofa movement. We forget, we will say that, well, some of us will say we are our ancestors. We forget that they are their ancestors too. So we will, those who are doing the volunteer rape thing, they are going to Europeans um, to be bedded by Europeans, to be, "Quote unquote," loved by Europeans, that is volunteer rape, as far as I'm concerned, because you are volunteering for your destroyers uh, to rape you. That's not an act of sex, wow. as far as I'm concerned. Wow. Um, let me. I'll ask you, and you can let me know if this makes sense. 
um, I was thinking of, of mental rape in connection with the uh, Montana Fishburn uh, pornography. A listener pointed out, uh, we, we talked about that incident last week, and a listener pointed out how in the video you see Montana Fishburn, you don't see the white person. You just see white hands, white body parts groping uh, this Montana Fishburn, this black female. And the non-white listener pointed out that it gives the illusion that it could be any white person. If you're a white person, you can imagine yourself uh, having sex with Montana Fishburn in this video because of the, the way the camera is shot, the, the perspective that's given. Um, would that play into mental rape that a, a white person, a racist watching this video uh, and to masturbate could think about mentally think about raping this black female Montana Fishburne with that picture concept? Oh wow, that's that's um, a major thought right there. Um, I hadn't thought about it in that way. That is a uh, if I can say that's a superb analysis. Um, my first thought, as you were saying that, is that this is the um, vicarious raping of African women by a white nation. So everybody is involved in this act. Everybody can join in in the orgy. Everybody can do whatever it is that they want to to this. And now we have a willing um, individual. We have someone who um, has come to us for whatever reason. Um, I would say, obviously, even though I don't know, obviously who was not forced um, to be violated by us, who wants to feel um, us exercise our supremacy on her body. So absolutely, that is um, physical, mental, and spiritual rape. Whenever whenever rape occurs, um, whether it's, to me, vicarious, and if we listen to our ancestors, your thoughts um, are part of the universe. We get into this, the, the creators everywhere all the time, but then the creator somehow doesn't get into our thoughts. When, when, when you... Um, According to our ancestors, and I believe my ancestors, when, when you lied, then you create a rupture in the, in your spiritual universe, in the spiritual universe. It was a horrible thing to do because it broke you away from who you are. It created a lie within yourself. It created a, 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 a contradiction in yourself. It created a fissure in your spirit. And when you're um, um, when you when you're talking about rape, then you're talking about not just a physical act. You're talking about a mental act that tears this person's mind to pieces, and you're also talking about rupturing their spirit. So you are um, touching, touching on. You are tearing into every aspect of that individual. And for African people, spirit is a very vital aspect of of you. Um, so to me, when I'm when I'm thinking about this, this um, I heard about the video. I didn't see it. But the way that you have explained it, um, it is to me as I would I would see that as as a a nation at play, uh, a nation exercising its supremacist prerogative to do what they want to to um, whatever female of the oppressed people they can get to um, participate in this and allow them to have access to uh, her body and for her to do it voluntarily as I said before, is the ultimate statement of the victory of supremacists, where you voluntarily go and allow this to be um, done to you by as many of them as is possible. Almost, not almost, you, you want this punishment. You know that you are inferior. You know that you deserve this. It's, it's the equivalent to me of a... Um, sister who um, is being physically abused by um, a brother or whoever, and she systematically goes back to be beat by this individual instead of getting out of that um, horrific situation, but she systematically seeks out ways for this to happen to her as if she deserves this punishment. So this to me is like, is if she deserves this rape, and the European nation, of course, is receiving its um, greatest satisfaction out of of um, having free access to those individuals who they have raped into submission. 
Okay. It's it's like when a when a when a um and I know that, that drugs are involved, but when a pimp is able to get his hands on a young girl and he is able to convince her in a number of ways that she should do this work for him, she doesn't have to tell her anymore. She doesn't have to um he doesn't have to go looking for her. She's gonna come and find him, either for the drugs or the um, attention that comes from his violation of her and her being put out on the street to do his work. Wow, uh, I want to see if eight one eight if she has uh, if she got her question answered. But I just want to play. This is Montana Fishburne answering uh, a question. The question she was asked was, "What are your fantasies? What?" Sexual acts, sexual films, which you like to participate in, and this is her response to that question. Um, I've started to explore bondage lately, so I, I'm really into that right now. Just getting tied up and a little bit of beating, and yeah, that's my new thing. So I'm definitely interested in exploring more of that. Wow, bondage and beating. That was what she said. Bondage and beating. And this is um. where it's going next. This is the sadomasochism accompanies the homosexuality and the pedophilia. So we can expect to see that very much among our children. Um, and from my understanding, it's already in work. I hear stories all the time now about the abuse of college females and particularly in HBCUs, being violated, being physically abused, being beat by their boyfriends who are in college. The tying up, the handcuffs, all the rest of this stuff, and every um, police show that you see on television, every one of them, virtually every crime, involves some kind of sexual violation. Before, it was simply murder. That was what got the ratings. Now, you're having the sadomasochism, the torture, all the rest of that. Uh, this, these were the movies, you know, eight, ten years ago. So you know what's going to be going on in another five or six years because those people have now matured into experts in what they do, if you will. Mm. Uh, 818, did you, uh, did you get your question answered or are you good? Your line is open, 818. Well, I actually had two more because <laughs> he said a lot that uh, really made me think. Um, Dr. Brody, you mentioned yes. something in, in, from the uh, Dictionary of Sex yes. that said the uglier the person was, the more exciting it was to yes. the white person. Um, I was wondering, now, I think dark skin is beautiful. Okay. I'm noticing, good. and I'm noticing when I see a lot of uh, pairings of black females with white men, they tend to be a lot darker, you know, even though we know it was white people who made it an ugly thing to be dark-skinned. Mm -hmm. um, and I was wondering with that, could it be that the darker a person is in skin color, the more exciting it is to the white person, like more of a sense of domination or excitement because that person in the eyes of white supremacy is closer to what they would picture as a savage further away from white? Yes. <laughs> okay. that, was, that, was, that was easy to answer. Absolutely, I would agree. And you have a lot of of um, masochists among European males who want to be dominated, and they see um, black folks in that image. A lot, a lot of um, in this image, and they are looking for someone who is that beast type person, that creature, that backward, that barbarian to dominate them, and they see that in the skin color. Um, we have a lot of, of um, quote-unquote, liberal whites who are talking about their black friends, but they forget that these people would never be friends with them in the first place if it wasn't for supremacy and those people's perceptions of them. So, yes, I would agree, absolutely. Okay, and I also wanted to ask, what chemical or biological effect, if any, do you think that the infusion of European DNA has had on African people in the Americas and elsewhere where we have mixed and that is one of the hardest questions that I get asked, and I respond in, in various ways. One of, one of them is that um, my thought would be a guess, since that's not my area of expertise. People have asked me about you know chemicals in the water and blah, 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 and I, I think that it does have an impact, and 
um, genetic um, uh, confusion or degeneracy in African bodies, it does have um, an effect. I don't know the degree. Um, I haven't studied that because that's not my area of of um, expertise. I'm, I'm a sociologist by training. Um, but it seems to me that there comes a time in a person's life when, when choices are made. Chancellor Williams talked about this in the destruction of black civilization, where people choose what side they're going to be on based upon their loyalty or disloyalty to um, their mother or their father's side. Um, I would, I am not a person who has an issue with the idea of of genetics. A lot of us do because of the bad name that we have received as a result of it in European scientific hands. Um, but I don't have a problem with it having um, an in, in, an influence to some degree in our lives. But I am a firm believer, like so many of of our scientists, that um, the um, the power of the black gene is much stronger than that of the white gene if we want to test them in terms of, of color. So it would take a whole lot. And I have, of course, met many people who um, are about as light as you can get, and some of them to the point where you can't distinguish them from Europeans um, who are adamantly African. Yeah, I was just asking because I've been doing a lot of reading this week and come across a lot of older books and writings by white people mm -hmm. about a plan to so-called eliminate the Negro problem or change black people over for the better by using the mulatto and infusing white blood into us as a people to so-called civilize us or make us better or give us certain traits, you know, that are supposed to elevate us. Mm-hmm. And we still, many of us, I'm not going to say we, because I don't. I know my mother doesn't. I know my wife doesn't. Um, but so many of us, subconsciously, in terms of how we think and act, we believe that too. Um, this this whole biracial thing, this whole thing, when, when, the, when the, the 70s kicked in and um, Roots came out and there was this slight movement to find your lineage, and some folks went to Africa, and some folks went and did the charts and all the rest of this. But that doesn't in any way, shape, form, or fashion even slightly compare to the number of Africans who went crazy when the popularity of finding what European might have raped his way into your um, bloodstream came. We, we went crazy trying to identify and declare. Of course, um, Henry Louis Gates is a prime example of that. But we went bonkers trying to find out what in us was white. We didn't act the same way when it came to finding out what that core in us, which is African. So we still believe that to a significant degree also, a major degree, we believe that that is better. And I talk to the students and they quietly concur and then they start giving examples. The, the teacher's pet in school now, in terms of the girl, still looks exactly the same as she did when I was going through school. And I'm 54 years old. The pretty boys, they still have the wavy hair, the lighter skin, and this is not their fault. It is the social perception. The things that are going on in terms of colorism and our relationship in society still speaks to the fact that we have a self-hatred that darker skin to us is still a major problem. That we still believe what we've been told. The repeating of the doll experiment tells volumes of how, even at very, very, very young ages, our children have been trained to be self-hating, and they prefer the doll that looks like an alien to a doll that looks like themselves. Uh -huh. If I uh, if I have time, do we have uh, do we have time for one more question, Doctor Bruce? One more question, yes. Okay, um, I just wanted to get your thoughts on uh, Doctor Welding has talked about a hypothesis if it was announced on the news that all of the black people were going to be rounded up and uh, executed, and she asked a white person, and a white person said very bluntly that she thinks. Most white people wouldn't do anything. They would, uh, you know, say, mm -hmm. oh, man, that's tough, that shouldn't happen, and they would go to bed and, you know, so long to the black people. 
Um, someone was thinking here, what would happen if the reverse took place, if it was announced that all white people were going to be rounded up at 12 midnight and they would be executed, how would black people respond? What are, you, what are your thoughts on that? How would black people respond to such a scenario? Well, I have two thoughts. First, on the first scenario given by um, Francis Cress Welsing, uh, most black people would, be, would not have a problem with that. Um, I have heard too many times in my childhood, we are our own worst enemy, and that said with spiteful hatred in the tone of the voice. I have seen too many things that indicate, as my mother told me as I was coming up, that if slavery was reinstituted today, you'd have a line of black folks from D.C. to Los Angeles trying to fill out applications to get jobs as overseers and drivers. So I don't think that black folks in general would have a problem with that. For some of us, because that would allow us there to be fewer of us to mess up their groove in getting close to Europeans. For some of us, because we are so self-hating, like they, um, some theorists say when a, when a black person is killing another black person, shooting them and saying, you know, die, nigger, die, that they are essentially trying to kill that which is in themselves and that other person they can't get rid of. So we really would like to get rid of ourselves. That's one of the reasons we want to look at genocide. We would respond to... Um, that roundup of white folks um, in a completely, totally opposite way because we see them as our saviors. We see them as our salvation. We see them in the same way that they have lyingly portrayed themselves uh, to us um, as gods, as the gift of God, as the favored sons and daughters of the Creator. So we would do everything in our power to prevent that from happening. I keep thinking um, over time, the, the, um, if you really want to become somebody in the eyes of the media, if you want to become someone in the eyes of black America, if you want to become someone um, globally as an African person, then you go save a European's life, and everything will come to you. All the doors will open up. You will be honored all over the place. You will make it to Oprah. You, you'll be everywhere. Everyone will see you because they still are seen as the supreme beings. They still are seen as those who know all, who are everywhere. They, they have the characteristics of the creator. And with the test tube babies and all the genetic stuff, now they have covered the other area where uh, the creator is all-knowing, the creator is everywhere, the creator has the ability to create life. The creator is all-powerful. So now they're covering that base, and we're buying it, you know, hook, line, and sinker. So I, I know that we would be having all kinds of of um, bad days, of pickets, of uh, protests. Uh, we would be marching on the United Nations in a way that we never would do for us. We would be um, known globally as the great humanitarians because of the fight that we would put up to save the rounding up of Europeans. So the exact opposite in my mind, the exact opposite, not just a, a semblance or slight, no, the exact opposite um, would occur, I firmly believe. Um, is the, the story, um, uh, what is that? Um, and then, um, where the aliens came, um, George Clinton of um, Parliament Funkadelic. Space Traders? The, yes, Space Traders. Um, Derek Bell had that in his book, um, not no name. Bases in the street, at the bottom of the well. Bases at the bottom of the well. Yes, uh, and that's interesting. Derek Bell, when he lost his job at Harvard, people were were so excited about that, and he's such a strong man. He lost his job because he was in protest because a non-African woman wasn't able to get a, had lost her job, wasn't able to get a job there. It had nothing to do with us. Um, in addition to the fact of who he's married to, but the face that that story to me, is very telling that if some aliens came and said, we'll save your world and turn your world into this pristine, Eden-like place, if you just let us take the African people from this planet so they can be slaves on our planet, do you think for a half a second we wouldn't be rounded up? And for some of us, we would be more than willing to go. Of course, others would be sad because they would lo lose um, sight of those people who they held in the greatest esteem. So, I agree. Wow. Um, 
It has been a real treasure uh, to have you with us again, uh, Dr. Baruti. I hope everyone listening, uh, please go to the website, akobenhouse.com, A-K-O-B-E-N, house. Dot com. Uh, he has done a plethora of just extremely informative, constructive books. Uh, we analyzed several of them at this point. The book we talked about today, The Sex Imperative. Uh, also, he's got uh, Homosexuality and the Effeminization of the African Male. Outstanding scholarship. Please support his efforts. We are just incredibly thankful that you could spend some of your Thursday afternoon with us, Dr. Baruti. And I have enjoyed this immensely every time I've been on. I have enjoyed this immensely, and I am looking forward to coming back. We are too, sir. We are too. I cannot wait to speak with you again. I will definitely be in touch, and I hope you and your family uh, take excellent care of yourselves. Thank you very much, and the same to you and everyone in the audience. Take care. Thank you so much, sir. We will talk to you soon. All right, take care. Goodbye. Context of white supremacy, justice, and Gus T. Renegade. Justice, did you have any, any thoughts that you wanted to share about today's broadcast? Um, uh, I did hear that uh, he said, actually, no, it wasn't him. He was on the sound clip. And, uh, um, what what was the person's name on the sound clip? I played a few of them. I played one from Dr. Combone where he talked about how black people are not very serious. Was that it? Um, it was the one because, like, cause like he said, uh, like white people are playing hardball. On the yeah. System. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that was very interesting, what, what he said. Mm. Yeah, that's Dr. Combone. I hope uh, people know who that is. Check out his work. Uh, I think we gave the website out before, uh, abibitumikasa.com, uh, abibitumikasa.com. Uh, he has a lot of uh, excellent work on racism, white supremacy. Hopefully we can get him on the program down the road. Yeah. Um, did you have anything else you wanted to share, Jeff? Uh, no, just it was a constructive show. Good. Did you want to give your email address? Sure. Justice.asap at yahoo.com. Again, justice.asap at yahoo.com. Um. I guess my, my few notes that I wanted to toss out, I am uh, conserving my energy because we are in the uh, context of white supremacy's end of summer blackout. I'm going to do the lineup, and you'll see why I'm conserving my energy and not hanging out for the full three hours today. But uh, I did want to announce, um, I believe Runaway is the person's handle, was asking about the chat room. Um, way back when, uh, in 2009, I think I said, when I get my MacBook Pro, I will open up the chat room. I have changed my mind. Uh, the MacBook Pro uh, order was put in today. I should have it next week. Um, I'm not opening the chat room back up. It's very non-constructive. There just is a lot of um, conflict and distractions, and the program is really set up for non-white people to listen and play to pay close attention uh, to what is said on this broadcast, not to get into arguments with other people in the chat room, uh, or sometimes it's not even arguments. Sometimes it's just discussions where the people aren't arguing, but it has nothing to do with what we're talking about, and I've just seen where it has a very non-constructive impact on the broadcast. So chat room is gone, not bringing it back, um, yeah. In fact, I would even say you can go back to some of the earlier broadcasts and you can hear the non-constructive impact that the chat room had on some broadcasts. I should make a list of programs that you can go back and check out and get excellent examples of why there is no chat room. But at any rate, I did want to address that. Thank you for listening in. Um, I wanted to also make requests. 
these are easy. Uh, since we got the MacBook Pro, easy request. I would like to have uh, Nita Hansen. She is the black female from the Dr. Laura Schlesinger uh, audio, the one who's married to a black person or married to a white person. And his friends were making racist comments, probably racist jokes too. And she called Dr. Laura to get advice and, uh, you know, um, Nita Hansen, she's been on, you know, TV and stuff. If someone can find contact information for her, I would like to have her on the program. That's one request. People, if you are good with the Internet and searching, see if you can get Nita Hansen. Uh, we would like her on the cows. I think that would be great. Erin uh, Magruder as well. The Boondocks, I don't know if it's ended officially, the television program, but um, I would like to have Erin Magruder on the show. So I would like to get people working on that. If you're good and you have some free time, get on the Internet and see if you can get contact information for Aaron Magruder, see if we can have him on the program. Um, dictionary of Sex, I put that in the description here at Blog Talk Radio. It should be scrolling by. Um, if you're listening to this program at Blog Talk Radio, you should see one of Dr. Baruti's texts. And as that scrolls past, the next book should be one of the dictionaries of sex that Dr. Baruti referenced on this program. You should be able to click it. I definitely would like to check out one of those. I learned something. Uh, I learned a lot today, but that was one of the many things that I learned during the broadcast. Um, <clears throat> uh, I want to – top, uh, the top investor at the context of white supremacy – Love, Truth, Liberation, in addition to being top investor, um, Love, Truth, Liberation, like, posted, I think at this point, over 100 videos on YouTube of different sound clips from the cow. She got whole programs over at YouTube, like over 1,000 uh, listens uh, or views over at YouTube uh, for one of the videos she put up of Dr. Baruti the first time he was here. She's just been... Um, incredibly supportive, and I just wanted to recognize her uh, spectacular effort, love, truth, liberation. Um, but, yeah, I wanted to give <clears throat> the lineup for the end of summer blackout, and uh, you'll understand why I'm conserving my energy and not uh, doing the full three hours. I'm going to actually go uh, backwards. I'm going to go backwards. So uh, this is when I, I think the end of summer blackout will officially end uh, September 7th. September 7th. September 7th, that's a Tuesday, Kush, the black unifier, he will make his return visit to the context of white supremacy on Tuesday, September 7th. Uh, on Sunday, September 5th, Dr. Frances Cress Welsing will make her sixth visit to the context of white supremacy. On Friday, September 3rd, Paul Ifaomi Grant, uh, he is a black male, United Kingdom. Uh, he's written several books directly about racism and white supremacy, uh, Why Willie Lynch Must, Must Die, uh, and other texts. He'll be here on Friday, September 3rd, uh, on Wednesday, September 1st. In Bewede, Aja Nshengi, uh, he is the founder of the Ghetto Times. Uh, he'll be here on uh, Wednesday, September 1st, uh, Monday, August 30th, Umar Abdullah Johnson returns to the context of white supremacy. Uh, this Sunday, August 29th, Ashra Kwesi and Marira Kwesi will be here. They're at uh, Kemet New. They do trips uh, to Africa. They have videos on racism, white supremacy, uh, and black male and female married couple. Both of them will be here. Uh, should be, uh, I hope, very constructive this Sunday uh, and tomorrow also making his fourth visit to the context of white supremacy. The Irritated Genie of Southeast uh, should be a very uh, constructive broadcast. Uh, but that is the lineup, and that's why I'm conserving energy. These programs are pretty close together. They're not, there's not a whole lot of space between broadcasts, so I'm trying to uh, make sure that I get through this uh, with lots of energy and we have lots of constructive dialogue. Um, so, yeah, we should be back tomorrow. Uh, white people permitting. We should be back tomorrow at uh, 7 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Central, and 4 p.m. Pacific. Irritated Genie making uh, visit number four uh, at the cows. I um, think I'm going to uh, see if I can get some rest 
and prepare for tomorrow's broadcast. I hope uh, people got some value out of the program. Um, Mac Payne's Corner, that will be coming up on one of the uh, upcoming broadcasts, only doing once a week. Um, and I think that will do it. Yeah, we'll be back tomorrow. Um, please support uh, Cree's efforts, Cree7.wordpress.com. Again, Cree7.wordpress.com. Uh, <coughs> excuse me, back of the bus as well, back of the bus as well, website, nonwhitealliance.wordpress.com. Uh, again, nonwhitealliance. Dot wordpress.com. Um, let's see, anything else I want to plug before we get out? Eb, she called in, 818-EbonyNewsChannel.blogspot.com. Um, Again, EbonyNewsChannel.blogspot.com. Thank you all for tuning in. End of summer blackout. I hope everyone who invested, I hope the blackout will say, wow, it was worth the investment. Lots of constructive programs and all black people. I hope, uh, I hope it will be great. I'm hoping it will be great. Um, thank you, everybody. We'll be back on Friday, August 27, 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific. Context of white supremacy signing out.